Awesome. Okay. So welcome everyone um, to one of another one of APSA's interactive sessions for the 2022 to 2023 academic year. So we're really pleased to host tonight's session with current trainees to answer general questions that you guys might have about the physician scientist training program and the application program um, process. Just as a reminder, today's um, webinar is part of an ongoing kind of supporting the applicants webinar series. And so we encourage you all to attend um, the following ones that we have coming up. I know we have one coming up on September 8th about interviews. So be on the lookout for that as well. Uh, so I'd first like to um, welcome our wonderful panelists who have graciously agreed to join us today um, and answer you guys' questions um, that you submitted. So um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Um, so including their uh, role, their current um, institution, um, and also going to ask them to tell you a little bit more about what they're currently doing at their stage in training. Um, so how about we start off with Cynthia? Hi, everyone. My name is Cynthia Tang. I go by she, her, um, and I'm a fifth year MBPhD student, third year PhD student in bioinformatics at the University of Missouri. Um, I graduated from undergrad in 2015, and then I did a one-year post-baccalaureate research fellowship uh, doing bench research. Um, I decided I did not enjoy bench research, so I went into two years of clinical research as a coordinator and loved that and realized that I really enjoyed clinical research and I really enjoyed um, patient care. So I applied to the University of Missouri and... Um, started med school, and now in my PhD, I'm studying the um, evolution spread and clinical impacts of SARS-CoV-2. So I'm happy to answer any questions about gap years, transitioning from preclinical to research, and um, I recently got an F30 grant, so I'm happy to talk about grant writing as well. Awesome. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, Sunny, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hi, my name's Sunny Green, she, her pronouns, and I am an MS1. Um, so in the very first year of my program, um, med school side, and um, at University of Miami, excuse me. And I graduated in 2019 um, from a liberal arts college in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, and so I took also a gap year, a few gap years um, at the NIH. Um, I'm happy to talk about the process of figuring out how I want to do an MD PhD program from a liberal arts institution um, and how my experience at the NIH was and then transitioning back into school is. Um, I've had one laboratory research uh, rotation. Um, that's how University of Miami sets up their program. So I'm happy to talk about that experience as well. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, next up, Gina. Hi, everyone. I'm Gina. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I um, am a first year at the University of Pennsylvania. I just started. Um, I graduated from Duke in 2020 and then did two gap years where I was working at Weill Cornell and studying um, latent tuberculosis using a mouse model for that. Um, and I'm broadly interested in infectious disease um, research as well as like immunology. Um, for my, my PhD, but I've yet to kind of decide that yet since I'm early on um, in the program, but I would be happy to talk about um, you know, gap years, like some of the other people in this panel, um, going through the application process, the like in kind of the virtual application process, I know is a little new, so I could talk about that as well, um, but really happy to be, be with you guys tonight. Awesome, and Maria? Hi, I'm Maria. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a rising fourth year, um, so rising fourth year in the program, rising second year grad student at Columbia University. Um, I graduated in 2019 from Penn State University and went straight through, um, so I guess I could talk about that, um, but honestly, I'm feeling, I'm starting to feel far from the admissions process. I feel like it was a while ago. <laughs> Um, but uh, I think things that were more recent to me is just the transitions between med school and grad school, which I found has been like the hardest part so far as all the changes in these programs. Um, I'm in the biomedical engineering PhD program and I'm studying lung tissue engineering, um, bioreactors. Uh, and so I can talk about engineering, I guess. <laughs> um, and that's about it. 
Great. And finally, Salvador. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just go by Sal, uh, he, his pronouns. Um, I am at Rosalind Franklin University, the Chicago Medical School. I'm an M3, so I've gone all the way through the graduate program. I got my PhD in February, and I restarted clinical stuff uh, in June. So I've done my emergency medicine, my surgery, and then now I'm on my psych rotation. So I can tell you about that transition back into the clinical world. Um, my uh, PhD was in resuscitation sciences, so using um, defibrillators and um, using them to improve outcomes from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and that's kind of been a continuation from my undergrad research where I was at uh, the University of Michigan, and I worked in an ECMO lab, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And so the common thread through all that has been I've been using large animal models like sheep and pigs. So I know it's a little different than most people, but um, it's something that uh, I'm quite familiar with at this time. So I could definitely answer questions about any of that stuff and um, kind of being on the other side of the research world. Awesome, thank you guys for all introducing yourselves and thank you again for being here. Um, we're so grateful that you took your time out of your day and your evenings to join us virtually um, to share some wisdoms and some pearls when thinking about this this um, this career, right, as a physician scientist. Um, and so my name is Carrie Davidson, and I'll be your moderator for the evening. I'm a second year um, at Yale in the MD-PhD program. Um, in the chat box, we have Monica, um, who is an M1 at the University of Miami. Um, so as has already been mentioned, please be sure to submit your questions to her um, during um, the course of the evening, if you have any. Um, and our volunteer live tweeting tonight is Eli Wisdom, um, who is an M2 at OHSU. So thank you for doing that too, Eli. Um, so for those of you that might have to step away at any point um, during the tonight, just a reminder that this is being recorded and it will be posted. You'll get an email um, telling you where it's posted shortly after. Um, as a moderator, as I mentioned before, please submit Q&A questions. Um, we have a team, we have Monica, um, Monica kind of looking at that chat, um, waiting for you guys to submit questions. Um, and so I think that's all the announcement I have for now. So thank you all again for being here. And I'm going to go ahead and ask one of the, one of the first questions um, that was pre-submitted to our panelists. So a lot of the applicants are kind of in the application season right now, kind of I guess it's we're in the secondary season, secondary writing and starting to think about those interview seasons. Um, so one of the questions that we, we got in was, what were some of the fears or doubts that you had prior to and, and during the application process? Um, so how about um, prior to the application process, um, Sunny or Gina, do you wanna tackle that for us? Yeah, sure, I can, um, especially coming from a really small liberal arts school. Um, one of my biggest fears was that I was going to be um, immediately dismissed uh, because of my background. I don't come from a big name institution. Um, I don't have uh, a lot of biomedical research prior to, uh, to my post -bac. Um, I had some really cool, interesting research experience. Um, I did marine biodiversity research in undergrad. Um, my undergrad did have a biology major, but it was really um, environmental science focused. And um, so I was able to, to take advantage of those research opportunities, but when it came to biomedical sciences, I didn't have a whole lot, um, which is ultimately why I also decided to do a post -bac. Um, Not only did I wanna see if I wanted to spend time in a lab because um, I'd been in the field, um, which is very different. Um, but I also wanted to have some sort of experience. Um, so there's a lot of, I guess, uh, imposter syndrome, um, feeling like I was gonna be immediately dismissed, uh, questioning the validity of my GPA and if I was gonna be prepared enough to take the MCAT. Um, and then I knew once I could if I could get to an interview and talk to people, I would feel a lot better. Um, not that getting an interview is a guarantee, but it makes me feel better if I can actually have a conversation with someone rather than just being dismissed on paper. Um, I think those are my, my, were my biggest fears. Gina, do you have more to add? I, no, I agree. I think I felt very 
like I didn't know how my application would read. You don't really, I don't think there's really a way, even having gone through the cycle, I don't fully know what a good application looks like because I don't sit on admissions committee. I don't know, you know, what they talk about in those meetings. Um, so definitely a lot of concern about, you know, how my application will stand out, if I have enough research experience. Um, even though I, I was doing two gap years, it still doesn't feel like enough. It feels like you need like a first author publication and you need to like have a bunch of accolades to get accepted. That's definitely not true. So don't don't like be worried about that. Um, but it's it's a scary process and it's very vulnerable putting yourself um, out in an application and sending it off for all these schools to read. I want to just like emphasize Gina's point about um, publications because um, that that was a during the pro, um, application process. I was very late in in and like submitted most of my secondaries. And actually, like um, an alum gave a talk at my school and said, like, yeah, like you absolutely need a first author publication to get in, or else my school won't even consider you. And I didn't submit some of my secondaries based on that. Um, and uh, I didn't have any publications at all. And I, it's completely false. I've talked to so many directors since then. And like, that's a publication can be a sign of a lot of work that's gone in, but it can also just be like right, right place, right time. Um, it is absolutely false that you need a publication to get into an MD PhD program and to reiterate, to like emphasize how true that is. Like the graduation requirement for my PhD is one first author publication. You don't need a PhD to get into a PhD. <laughs> Definitely, I, that, I think that's like one of the memorable moments from tonight already. You do not need a PhD to get into a PhD. Um, Cynthia or Sal, is there, did you have any, any doubts, would you say, during the application process? Um, maybe if you, if you can think back to when you were maybe even doing secondaries or preparing for interviews like some of our applicants at the moment. For me, the I had the same doubts that everyone else had mentioned, just not being good enough, feeling like you had to have already saved the world before getting accepted into med school. Um, and I feel like some of the biggest things to remember is that I think most places understand that not everyone has the same opportunities. And so it's about making the most of what you have access to and conveying that in your application. Um, and then just making sure that you emphasize what you've got out of it and how that'll help you in the future. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I think for me, I had a super strong research background. So I was like very confident in um, that part of my application, but um, I actually didn't, I was not accepted anywhere my first like cycle. So I actually uh, applied to a post back to kind of strengthen my program or my application. And then I only got into the PhD program because during my post back, uh, I was connected with uh, one of the professors that was at my university and I applied to the PhD during my M2 year. So um, I, there's lots of stuff about all of that that we can get into, but um, yeah, just even a general medical school application was um, a little tall, too tall of a task for me at that point. So um, yeah, applying was, I never want to have to do that again. That was miserable. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Um, I think I, before we move into specific questions that we have kind of about the application, process, a question that just came in um, is asking, what general advice do you guys have for someone who is very new to this path, right? So someone who's maybe kind of already thinking MD or just thinking PhD and just kind of found out about an MD PhD. I know I found out about the MD PhD only in my junior year of college. Um, so for someone that's kind of exploring that right now, what are some general advice that you, you have for them and maybe figuring out whether this is the right, um, you know, the right thing for them to do? Um, and I'm going to ask anyone to, to tackle that. It'll take maybe one or two of you before we move on. I also didn't know about um, MD PhD programs. Like I didn't even know that they existed until in between my sophomore and junior year of college. Um, I didn't know that that was even an option. 
Um, and I actually wasn't even really decided if I wanted to do um, medicine. I knew I really liked science. I really liked physiology. I'd always had an inclination towards that. Um, but again, the opportunities at my university weren't really uh, geared that way. Um, so I would say the biggest advice is a lot of self-reflection, which I know it isn't a whole lot of advice. Um, and everyone has different ways of self-reflecting. Um, but begin asking yourself the questions of what would make you feel satisfied in, in your career, but also in, in your life and, and what your kind of passion is. Um, for me, I realized that after I got to experience kind of seeing MD PhDs in action at the NIH, um, I had a, a summer internship in, in between my sophomore and junior year, and then again in between my junior and senior year. Um, so I got to really see uh, the role of a physician scientist and how actually each physician scientist has a little bit of a different role. Um, you, you know, some want to do mostly research and so maybe they only see patients 10% of the time. And I saw the other side where maybe if a physician or a scientist is seeing patients 10, like 90% of the time and only research 10% of the time. But the commonality between them all was really this desire to pull both the research and the clinical side together um, and that they felt like they needed both to be the best physician or to be the best researcher that they could be. Um, and so I'd say a lot of the self-reflection is asking yourself, what do you really feel like you need in your life to feel satisfied with what you're doing and that you're doing, or at least for me, it was like, am I doing enough? Can I, I can always be doing more. And what is the best way for me to apply that? And ultimately I came to the decision that if I just did a PhD program, I would love the science, but I would lose sight of who I'm really helping. And that I needed to see patients in order to feel um, connected and to feel like I was making a difference. But I knew if I followed an MD only path, I would get so incredibly frustrated that there wasn't more that I could do. So I was like, well, here's the perfect option. I can do both. I can meet patients. I can help them. I can help, uh, you know, maybe it's not a therapy, but maybe it's just treating their symptoms and I can go back to the, the bench um, or back to the laboratory and ask those questions and learn more so that I can help them further. So I think it's just a, what you want in your life and what you want overall. Awesome. Thank you, Sunny. Cynthia, I think you also wanted to jump in. Yeah, um, I would just add to what Sunny was saying, because I think she made really good points. Um, I, I almost have a slightly cynical view of this, but I would recommend really making sure that this is what you want to do. And this goes to just med school alone and MD-PhD. Um, and it's a really long and difficult road. And I don't have any regrets. I love what I do, but there are some really bad days and really bad weeks and months that you just have to power through. And if this is really not for you, it's not gonna work out. Um, so I would try to get as much experience as possible in the lab um, and in the clinic, try to try different kinds of research. So I did bench and like I said before, didn't enjoy that at all. I tried clinical research and loved it. Now I'm doing computational research and it's that's a lot of fun for me. Um, yeah, I think those are those are my points. And then for med school, I would also say consider other options as well. Almost think of it as like, what other things can I do that would fulfill that would be fulfilling for me? And if there's nothing else, if there's you know a, a real reason why you want to specifically become a physician, then do med school and then consider an MD PhD. Yeah, I, I can jump off of that, Cynthia, um, because I'm in the clinical realm now, um, and so I can I can pretty safely say that, you know, if you just want to help treat patients, there are many ways to do it. Um, PAs have a lot of autonomy, um, and they have a much shorter route. Um, you know, nurse practitioners, uh, CRNAs, there's all these different um, pathways that you need to consider um, because med school is undoubtedly the longest, most grueling um, path and MD-PhD on top of that is um, 
not for the faint of heart. Uh, and I feel like you need to truly love it because like Cynthia was saying there, there are days, weeks, months where you just are, you know, things aren't going the way that you want them to go. Um, and your friends are doing other stuff and your friends not in medicine, um, you know, or, or in careers. And especially for someone like me, who I'm at the, you know, I've gone through the pathway. I'm um, many years removed from undergrad. My friends are becoming managers and higher up in their careers, you know, so they actually have a good income and all that stuff. So life starts to happen outside of medical school. Um, and that's like one of the things that you don't kind of consider, like you, you need to be in love with this stuff, uh, both research and both medicine, um, because uh, there's ways to do either or, and it doesn't require this pathway. Um, so I guess if you're doing this for money, there are way easier ways to make money. There are so many other ways to have a good salary. Um, and if you're doing it for research or for just patient interaction, I think you should consider alternate routes and figure out why you don't want to do those and why you want to do medicine instead. And like really think about it um, because if you're doing it for money or prestige, it's, you know, there's a lot that you're going to have to sacrifice for that. Um, and I'm on the tail end, so I'm a little more, maybe not jaded, but I've just seen and lived it. So I'm just telling you from experience. I also want to add, um, you can still do research, even if you just get an MD, you can still do research with just an MD. Um, the training's not quite as rigorous or you know, it's not the same level of training, but I, I know a lot of MDs that are amazing researchers too. Sorry, I kind of zoned out for a bit because I <laughs> answered a great question that was in the Q&A, but um, I, uh, yeah, I just, I like was kind of listening to some of what was said and I like totally agree in that, like, I think I've like met some students who like, we all know the pre-med process competitive, a grind. If they can think of a hoop to make you jump through, they're going to come up with three more. <laughs> but um, I think that some people have had like a little bit of the misconception that um, an MD PhD will make you more competitive for residency and that like it makes you a better med student. Don't do a PhD just to get into residency. <laughs> um, MD PhD was originally established to create scientists, first and foremost. Um, who are able to translate um, everything that the basic sciences and the applied sciences have to offer to medicine. Um, and it's theoretically supposed to be 80, 20, 80% research, 20% medicine. That's not to say that like in reality, the statistics come out that it's an even distribution between anywhere between 100% research to 100% medicine. Um, so you can do anything. However, you really wanna come into this with the mentality of being a scientist first and foremost. Um, and, uh, that's, um, so I think like if you're struggling between like, Hey, I really love medicine, but like, maybe I want to do research, consider MDMS, which is incredibly common. Um, I think about 50% of the class here every year takes a year off to do an MS, an MBA or an MPH. Um, it's like very, like a lot of medical schools like, are heavy in research, um, and, and even without, um, even without doing a master's degree, a lot of people take a year off to do research in the middle of medical school. Um, and beyond that, a lot of people take a year or two or three off in the middle of residency to get into a more competitive fellowship. So, um, like I, I have friends who are in the MDMS program, um, friends who are in MDM because I'm my, my med school class right now is just finishing, like it's in the middle of their year off. Um, and, uh, and, and in my lab, there's multiple, um, people who have graduated and are in the middle of general surgery residency and are taking two years to do, we do, we also do a lot of large animal work. So I, I know what you're talking about, Sal, <laughs> um, although your work sounds cooler. Um, and, uh, we, um, yeah, we have general surgery residents who are working full-time in the lab for two years to, to apply into, um, competitive surgical subspecialties. So there's a lot of opportunities to do research along the way, but don't feel like you have to do it. Um, if you, if your inclinations are really more towards patient care, like go do that, that's important. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, I think self-reflection and kind of exploring, right? 
why it is that you really want to go into this program is is a really important part of the process. And I think it also kind of feeds into the next question, um, which I'll just have, um, I'll have uh, Sunny and Sal, maybe you can try and tackle this from um, someone being a bit closer to the application process and someone being a bit further out. But um, the question is like, what makes a competitive application, right? And maybe that self-reflection, some of you might agree, kind of feeds into making you stand out as an applicant. Um, I can get started on this one. Um, just because I've seen some applications and I've been in a few like uh, like t interview type things, but um, you've probably heard it before. The most compelling thing is like a, a narrative or something that uh, makes you an individual. And I would say almost it's almost better if it has nothing to do with medicine um because it's got to be something like incredibly special if it is medicine related because almost all of us have volunteered in a hospital we've done work in a lab you know and we can maybe have a patient story that's kind of significant or something like that um so it's like something that really has to stand out if you're going to go that pathway but um there, there's so much more to us um, outside of pre-med and who we are. Um, I know for me, um, I, my undergrad, I did uh, one of my, uh, my minor was in writing. And so I did a lot of, I spent a lot of time talking about medical humanities and just humanities in general. And um, that was something that I think really helped me. And I connected with, um, she's, uh, um, one of our professors here uh, was the sponsor for the Medical Humanities Club, and so she really connected with me when I was interviewing, um, and that was really important, and I think that having that narrative about um, why that's driving you to medicine is important, um, so I'm not sure if that's super helpful, because that's not really concrete. It's a much more abstract thing, but um, I think if you're doing it all the way through undergrad and you kind of are have a, a good explanation of why you think it'll make you a better clinician or why it makes you want to go into medicine, uh, then that's something that's very, that stands out and it makes you a strong applicant because you're not just saying, oh, I like, I had a good experience with a patient, so I want to be a doctor, you know? Um, so I could be more specific if necessary, but that's kind of just get that narrative of who you are and why you're an individual. Yeah, I completely agree with everything Sal just said. Um, if anything, actually, the things that make you unique that someone else wouldn't have had exposure to, like for me, marine biodiversity research, like that's not at all related to medicine, but you can t like frame that in a way that tells a story about who you are and why you went down the path that you went down. So for me, I was able to say, okay, well, this research taught me how to tell a scientific story, which is important. But more than that, I'm able to draw on that previous experience to be creative or inventive in the laboratory or um, developing a new technique or something. Um, so I think you can spin anything that you have experienced in your life um, to show your strengths, not only just like your uniqueness of what makes you you, but also how that experience will make you a better physician scientist. Um, and so, yeah, it's not concrete. I'd say an application is really learning how to tell your story in a way that becomes cohesive. So someone can see your application and recognize the person behind it and isn't so cookie cutter. Um, or even if there's something like you're concerned about your GPA or your scores or kind of like all the standardized, the application and secondaries are really your place to show that you're more than just a numbers game. And I think truthfully, something I realized throughout the applications process is yes, the MCAT and the GPA and all those standardized things might be important, um, when like splitting hairs between applicants truly the person behind it is more, more important. Programs want unique individuals. They want diverse experiences. So um, 
it is not necessarily a concrete thing, but uh, yeah, a, a way to tell your story in a comprehensive um, and something that I feel like coming to the program, um, I saw one of the questions was kind of like, what's, what's the best um, moment in your PhD, MD, PhD journey so far? And for me, I think part of it is just feeling like everything in my life that I've experienced and gone through and done prior to this, somehow it all feels like it clicks, like it all makes sense and it feels very right, um, which is more just like a feeling, but I'm like, wow, I can't believe I have experience in this very random thing. And it is so applicable to me now and it makes sense how I got here. Um, and I think if you start feeling that in, in relation to applying to an MD PhD, you'll figure out how to tell your story. Awesome, thank you so much, Sunny. Um, so I, I wanted to pose that question as well to you guys. Um, and maybe Maria, maybe you can add to it. So, you know, what is one thing that have ma has made you feel a sense of achievement in your MD PhD program so far? Um, so I was just typing, I, I really think taking care of patients, that was like by far the best part. Um, I, so at Columbia, you do a year and a half of preclinical and then you do two out of our eight clinical rotations before you basically like drop out of med school and like take step one and then go into grad school. Um, so I did peds and neuro and uh, I just like particularly on neuro and neuro oncology even like um, I'm interested in both neurology and oncology and neuro oncology. I, di I didn't know that was even a thing and it was fantastic. Um, but uh, just being there for people, it feels so important. I have never had less sleep in my life. And I've also like never felt like my work was more important or more satisfied with it. Um, it's really hard. <laughs> a lot of tears were shed, but, um, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I think I actually came into MD PhD questioning whether I really wanted to do medicine afterwards. Um, I think I was like considering just going full-time research which so I guess just so you know, it's okay to go in and not totally be sure. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, after doing some med school, I'm sold on med school. It was great. I mean, it sucked, but it was great. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Maria. Um, and so this next question, I'm gonna um, pose to Cynthia and Gina. Um, someone's asked, what is the single thing, if you can name a single thing that's helped you the most in getting to where you are today? If I had to pick a single thing, I think the biggest one for me is, I might have more than one, but the the main one for me is to learning to communicate with different people um, and realizing that not everyone communicates the same way. And this sounds very straightforward, but you don't always realize that when you communicate with different people and then um, realize that there are some challenges with that. And that goes with patients, it goes with PIs, people you work with. Um, so that, that's probably one of the big ones. And then just being able to express what you do and what you're looking for, I think has helped me a lot. Um, for me, I would say, um, working with having really good mentors and people to look up to, especially in the physician scientist path, um, has been really excellent and, um, you know, having PIs and people who really believe in me, even when I'm not like sure if I can do this path, if I'm like capable of this, like to get you through the imposter syndrome, people who really um, invest in you um, as a student, as a researcher, um, those are, I think, what's really gotten me to where I am. And I think also kind of going back to the question about if the physician scientist path is right for you, I would definitely recommend talking to some people in the path. Maybe, I mean, you're here at this panel, which is great, but some, maybe some people who are you know, professors who are maybe PIs that are physician scientists and what um, they think the PhD did for them. Um, and then talking to people and maybe other research fields as well, I think can be really, really great and really helpful. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, so we're gonna kind of moved and shift gears a bit to kind of some general questions about life as an MD PhD. So moving a bit away from the application process. Um, and so on a lot of the a lot of the people's minds right now is kind of having an idea of what does your day-to-day -day life look like um, as an MD PhD trainee, right? Um, and so 
how about I think we have a few different stages on the chat today um so I'm actually going to ask you guys to like all kind of give briefly right what your day-to-day -day looks like um and so how about we start with Sal kind of and we'll go backwards maybe <laughs> uh sure so um I guess right now with clinical stuff it's like you get up uh I liken it to um Okay, so you get up and you go to like your clinical stuff and depending on the rotation, you do some pre rounding so you get on your um, uh, electronic medical record and you look up the patients see if anything changed from the night before, and then you go and tell your residents and then um, you go and wait for your attendings and then you round on your patients and that's generally what it is for most services. Um, and. So that's where you spend most of your time. And I have downloaded like uh, UWorld, which is a question app. And so I do that on my phone when there's downtime. Um, and then you get home and you're exhausted and you look at your computer and you think, do I do some questions or do I make dinner and go to sleep? And that's generally my day to day. Uh, and then uh, it's not as bad as um, like M1, M2. I, I hang out with my friends a lot more. Weekends are pretty relaxed where I see family, hang out with friends. Uh, and generally do stuff. So it's definitely much more relaxed than your first two years where you're just studying constantly. Um, and being in the clinic and seeing, like working with patients and working with uh, residents and attendings is it's much better, um, definitely. Um, and then for graduate school, real quick, graduate school for me was when I had experiments, I was there and I was working hard and then I'd go home and I'd not worry about grad school at all. And I'd take weekends off and um, grad school was more relaxed in terms of the hours spent doing stuff, but far more taxing mentally on will this project work and how much writing do I have to do? Will this ever end? <laughs> so it's the day to day is not as bad, but it's the general conception of the PhD that's much more taxing. Awesome. Thank you. Cynthia, do you want to give us a spiel? Sure. Um, I agree. Grad school for me is, this is probably the best work-life balance, the healthiest work-life balance I've ever had in my life. Day-to-day um, -day will sound a little boring. I've finished my classes, so now it's just focusing on research. And as a computational person, I'm pretty much just sitting behind a computer um, all day. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I will say hobbies have become really important for me. <laughs> And during COVID, I've developed quite a few. So that's been really healthy for me. And I that's something I kind of um, wish I would have done during the first years of med school as well, is just making, like carving out time and keep really protected time for something fun. Thank you. Maria? Sorry, let's type in. Um, they're talking about like day to day. Um, so yeah, um, grad school, it's great. Work, my work life balance, like, there's honestly been days that I like, such as today, when I show up to work at 11 and I leave at five. <laughs> but uh, it definitely comes in waves. And I think like, you know, I showed up to work at 11 and I left at five because we had a three day long animal procedure before that where like, you just don't leave the hospital. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but I think, I think it's like kind of a nice in that like you, one of like one of the fears or concerns or like things that might be up in the air is like yeah this is like an eight year long commitment um and so you're you're going through your life then and like most of us are in our like 20s to 30s and like you're like defining your young adulthood and um it's kind of nice to like I thought that it'd just be constant grind and then I was like giving something up and actually you're not your life continues and I feel like I've actually had some time med school pushed me to, to develop in a lot of ways and like empathizing with the people that I was meeting and across, you know, both in staff and patients. And then um, grad school has allowed me to step back and like have some more time to focus on, I don't have any immediate rewards from my work and I probably won't for the next like several years. So um, I'm allowed time now to like reap the rewards of the relationships and really invest time in like my friends again, my family and my hobbies and I didn't know I was going to get to do this. This is great. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sunny. 
other than the existential dread that comes with like having no feedback from your work for several years. <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, I'm at the very beginning. Um, so it's it's really just med school classes for me. Um, I have class usually from eight to noon, and then Miami lets us have our afternoons to decide how we devote that to studying. Um, for me, uh, because I've been out of school for a while, I'm realizing I need to relearn how to uh, study, um, if that makes sense. And that some of the ways I used to study in undergrad and in high school aren't necessarily the most efficient um, for the faster paced uh, and volume of information in med school classes. And so um, my weeks are really just <laughs> learning information, figuring out how to study, and then an exam every two weeks. Um, so it's not really uh, flexible <laughs> as far as like lab work. Um, so I'm also adjusting to that because I also, like uh, Maria said, like sometimes I would, in the lab, I would have days of it's very relaxed and then some days are busier, which is different than kind of the constant trying to like drink from the proverbial fire hose of med school classes. Um, so that's kind of, that's where I'm at. It's uh, just learning how to uh, get my feet under me as I begin med school classes. Um, and what I'm coming across now is that I'm realizing because I've been in research so long, kind of my research brain almost gets in the way of my med student brain because my research brain wants to know absolutely everything about anything, um, which is not going to be the most efficient when it comes to medical school. So, Thanks, Sunny. And Gina, what does your day today look like? Yeah, I also just started. So it's pretty similar to Sunny um, trying to um, learn how to study in med school. It's different from undergrad, um, taking a lot of courses at once and trying to, you know, come home and study more and trying to balance it all. So kind of trying out different methods. Um, but basically, it's a mix for me of um, lectures and like small group learning classes, which has been nice. Um, I am basically a med student. We have like one kind of journal club type class um, that's like MD PhD specific. That's kind of the only thing that's different from a typical um, med student schedule. Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, trying to find time to um, manage relationships, manage hobbies, manage, um, you know, life outside of med school, I think is something I'm trying to balance. Um, still figuring it out, but seems like there's some um, more time in the grad school phase. So you guys are giving me a lot of, a lot of hope. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Gina. Um, and so I think to, to help Gina, Sonny, and even myself as an M2, um, Maria, Cynthia, and Salas is kind of a question for you, but I guess if you could back in your year one and two, so your pre clinical years, how do you, how did you guys manage, you know, balance work life kind of everything and kind of doing hobbies back then I know some of you mentioned you do a lot of hobbies now during your PhD but back then how was that balance what did that look like for you guys for me um kind of what I said before is just prioritizing it and just scheduling that when you make your schedule schedule in an afternoon where you're just um spending time with family or friends or something, making sure that you carve in time that for things that are important to you outside of medicine um, and almost make it non-negotiable to where you make sure that the things that make you happy stay in your life. Um, there wasn't a ton of balance, uh, I would say. So I think Cynthia, Maria, maybe you guys had it, but I had step one and it was a numerical score. Um, so like life for me was wake up, maybe it was, I was actually in a very strict routine because the routine was the only thing that allowed me to have sanity in a weird way. I would wake up, work out, and then um, either do lectures for the day or do like questions until noon. And then in the afternoon, I would study, uh, like go over the questions. And then I would do kind of like group questions with like three or four friends that I had. And that was like, that was the majority of my life for three or four months during M2 year. And then the rest of the time was a variation on that, but just like in whatever block we were in. Um, so 
there wasn't a lot of balance and that's why getting into the graduates like phase it was amazing to have time uh like I was talking with Maria I started reading um I learned how to play hockey and um did some other stuff and just like visited friends and went on trips um so yeah it's hard to really have balance during your first two years um but it's also important to find ways to keep your mental health good and uh, for me, that was the routine and exercising and eating right. Um, yeah, so this it's tough. There's not really a there's there's not. It's hard to have balance, I would say. I agree. I think I also had very minimal balance, um, <laughs> but I think the best advice I ever got was from my older N three roommate at the time, and she said like, "The work is going to be out of your control. The you know." the chaotic factors of just being in the hospital are going to be out of your control. The only thing that you can control is your body. Um, and so therefore start with sleep, eat and write, exercise if you can. Um, and that is like, if you, can, you can't control the panic thoughts in your mind all the time too, and the anxiety. So all the external factors out of your control, your mind, sometimes you can't help but be panicked, but take care of your body first and the rest will be easier to uh, manage to react to. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, do I wish I had better balance during the first year um, or year or two? Yes, um, but I think that also I was really absorbed in, in the world of medicine. And like, at the time, like all of my friends, you know, were in med school too. And so they're all going through it. And so I think studying with people and then like, I'm also fairly introverted not being with people when I didn't want to be was was good um just finding a healthy balance there but like I think um don't it, it is very very hard but like don't be so afraid because you also like you're you're gonna have your med school classmates and like a lot of them become great friends I've like feel like I've been extraordinarily fortunate in that like I really really love my med school class they're all wonderful people um and uh so I think like you're not going through it alone. Um, but yeah, I, I I actually like, I don't feel like I had balance, but somehow I still weirdly wish I had put in more work because step one was like the most miserable experience of my life. <laughs> step one for a score. Um, don't worry, it's pass fail now. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, and I think like it was also nice like just a plug for pass fail programs. Columbia's pass fail for the first year, year and a half. And that, that also was like a little bit helping to ease the sanity for those who are not in pass fail programs. I, I like, I give you credit, <laughs> but I also hope that like, you know, it's kind of like, if you, the other thing to realize is like, if you needed to know hundred percent of this information to be like a good doctor, they, they wouldn't let you move on through. <laughs> so it's, it's okay to like, you make multiple passes through this um, curriculum so many times and then you go and forget it all in grad school like me um and, and then you're going to come back to it and so um i think just like learn to forgive yourself too so that's that's my two sorry my rambling um two pieces of advice is like one first take care of your body and then second forgive yourself it, it will be okay yeah i just want to oh sorry go ahead um i just wanted to say it like when maria's saying i had great friends and I leaned on my classmates. Um, we all leaned on each other. Um, and like our study breaks, you know, we would just, we had like a ping pong table and we just like stand around the ping pong table. And um, I think you can't get through it alone or you shouldn't try to. Um, and definitely the, the pass fail made it much more of a collaborative effort where it was like, we all got to do this together. Um, and if you help each other out, you're just in a better state altogether. So everyone benefits from that. I agree with leaning on your friends and finding your community. I will also say, I remember first year of med school, I was getting advice from so many different people and so many different resources were being, I felt like was being thrown at me. Um, and pick and choose what you listen to and stick to what works for you. Like it's really easy to, hear that someone's doing using this resource and then you start adding that onto your pile and you start adding a bunch of stuff and that's not great so stick to what you know stick to what works for you um don't, you don't need to listen to everybody 
Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, and so I think like during the the process, even from applying to, I guess, even graduating from the MD PhD years later, we all evolve, I think, as students and as learners, where we learn different ways to study, has been mentioned. Um, and so there are a few kind of questions about specific interests that you came into the program with and kind of people are asking about if I have interest in public health research or basic science research, um, can it be a red flag? Some people have heard it's a red flag to kind of have multiple different interests kind of coming into the programs. Um, so I think so that's kind of a two part question, but as for the first part, Sunny and Gina, did you guys feel like you had specific interests coming into the programs and did you feel like the interviewers are kind of wanting you to give a specific interest when it came to applying? Um, I did have specific interests um, based on my previous experience and research. I knew that I was really interested in neuroscience and genetics, and I still am. Um, but I don't think my interviewers ever felt like I had to come in knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I think most, almost, I think all my interviewers, um, if I did say I had an interest, they'd be like, oh, why? Um, and honestly, a lot of them wanted to check that I would be able to keep an open mind if there was something else that I was interested in. Um, but they know that you're here for training and they know that you're here for a while. And so I think you don't have to know immediately what you want to do. Do know that you're interested in science and that you like science and you enjoy it. You want to do the research and you want to treat patients, but you don't have to know what you want to do specifically. Yeah, I also had um, particular interests, um, but I, I don't think that's necessary. Um, and you can definitely change your mind once you're in the program. I kind of, I feel like I realized this later on in the process because I think schools try and match you up with um, interviewing with professors that have similar interests to you or when they're, if you get to the point of recruitment, they're recruiting you with professors who might have similar interests to you. Um, but to some extent that doesn't matter because you're gonna to go to a probably a research heavy institution. There's gonna be a ton of great people and it's, you know, your, your like playground basically to go around and find like the people who, and the research that really fits you. Um, so yeah, and then I also wanted to add that, um, yeah, I think there was something about mastering or something in public about public health. There, there's definitely programs that are more friendly towards um, non-traditional applicants. So people um, interested in anthropology and um, global health um, and like history of science. Um, so there's a few schools that are um, more, more um, prepared to support those students. I think maybe more and more schools are like looking to recruit non-traditional students, um, but those are also you know, really valuable perspectives. And I think it goes into, you know, finding a good match for you that, of a school that has all the resources for your interests, be them broad, even if they're not, you know, traditional like bench science research. Awesome, thank you guys. And then for Maria and Cynthia, a question that's come in as well is, as you've kind of gone through, um, so far, how have you explored, I guess, different clinical interests? How have you gained kind of a broad exposure um, to different clinical aspects of, of medicine? Um, so I guess I'm still exploring. <laughs> I think that like you can learn a lot from shadowing. However, um, I feel like a lot of shadowing experience is often limited to clinic or um, the OR. And for some reason, I, at least I didn't, maybe others have different experiences, but like I actually like had no exposure to inpatient medicine, um, which is like, so there's three different environments. Inpatient is people who are staying overnight, multiple nights at the hospital. Um, and then clinic is, you know, the, kind of like your doctor's checkup when you go visit you know, you go in and you leave a half hour later or several hours later if you're waiting. Um, and then the OR, um, because I think a lot of people have an initial interest in surgery or at least want to explore that or see that. Um, I think like when I was young, I thought that I wanted to do surgery. So I shadowed a lot in surgery, I kind of realized it wasn't for me. Um, also because I want to do primarily research. And so um, the surgeon scientist pathway is extraordinarily demanding, um, can totally be done, but like also wasn't really what I wanted to commit to. <laughs> and, um, and, and then um, 
then you go through it again in med school. And I have, like I, I mentioned, I did pediatrics and neurology rotations. And then in our pediatrics rotation, adult ENT is built in. And then in our neurology rotation, we actually have three weeks of surgical subspecialties. So it was neurosurgery, urological surgery, and orthopedic surgery. Don't ask me how that fits with neurology. <laughs> but um, I think that was like a good initial exploration. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of things when I go through my other clinical rotations, like internal medicine, ob um, surgery. But um, yeah, I think I'm still learning, but I was actually surprised because a specialty that I had ruled out in my shadowing experience, which is neurology. Um, I, I actually did my neurology rotation before the PhD because they told us to do rotations that we didn't really want to go into um, before your PhD. So you don't have like, you're not looking for letters of recommendation like five years later. Um, so I did neuro because I wanted to get out of the way and didn't think I want to do it. Now I think I want to apply into neuro. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't know. I think, I think everybody's mind changes a lot. And you, uh, it's, it's good if you can get diversity in your shadowing experiences when you, um, when you're thinking about applying, especially because I think that I, I, the, one of the main reasons why I didn't want to go into medical school was because I was, I, I just wasn't in love with like the way that the people I'd met thus far treated patients and the interactions I'd seen. It was like, no, 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 like this isn't really what I want to be part of. Um, and then it was like one person that I happened to work with and well, two people, I guess, who really inspired me and changed. I was like, this is what medicine should look like. Um, so uh, yeah, I, th I think it's not super important to get a huge diversity before you apply, but as long as you find something you like and you're convinced that you want to be part of it, but if you can, it's a good thing. And you'll just continue to get that experience throughout medical school. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, so we've come to the end of our session. I can't believe an hour has passed uh, already. Um, but I wanted to say a massive thank you um, to, to you guys, our, our panelists. Um, you guys were great and I think gave some great pieces of advice, um, even to me, who's like, you know, <laughs> technically have done a year of this. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us. And of course, our participants for you guys out there as well for making the session interactive and for all the questions you asked, um, we thank you guys as well. I know that there are questions that we might have not have gotten to or people have been able to type question answers to. Um, so be sure to look at our panelist bios. Um, our emails are in there. I know there was an international specific question, so please feel free to email me about that um, separately if you'd still like to ask about international applications. Um, but yeah, there's so many people to thank, but um, thank you guys for joining us. And of course, the recording will be available if you want to sift through this again and um, if there are some things that you didn't catch. Um, but yeah, have a great evening, everyone.